Okay, flying foxes. We're going to deal with them now. Some, um, these are amazing animals. I said they're one of the biggest bats in the world, the flying foxes we've got here. South East Queensland, we've got three different species, and they've all got a little bit of difference in their um, biology. So this is what a big colony of flying foxes can do to vegetation. Um, they can really give it a pounding. But fortunately, this is uh, little reds and they move on. But let's, uh, let's get going. Next. Pollination. Now, there's a really big story in this. So with, um, with flowers, you've got anthers here that have got pollen all over them. And then you've got the stigma here that needs the pollen to be put into there to fertilise it so the seed develops. In the eucalypts, you can see the stigma poking out there, all the anthers here with all the little bits of pollen on it. Now, the next picture shows some very hungry flying foxes getting at it. And you can see all the stamens have dropped off and there's the stigma still in there. Now, with some of our most important hardwoods, um, like, and I'll show you a group of them, this... Um, <laughs> the stigma here closes up of a daytime. So all your lorikeets, bees, honey eaters and all that, they're not doing any pollination, okay? They're carrying pollen, they're feeding on nectar, but they're not pollinating because this part of the flower is closed. Okay, so it's got to be pollinated at night. And this was a bit of a surprise. It was only found um, in the sort of mid-90s by a student of mine. And... Um, it's a very important concept that eucalypts, these eucalypts will self-pollinate and there are other places where there's no flying foxes and this doesn't happen. But down the east coast there's a strong relationship with some of our commercial hardwoods and flying foxes. They're the ones that carry pollen from this lot of trees over the range to another area and it stops inbreeding and you get cross-pollination and it keeps the... Um, the forest is a lot healthier. Next one. Um, so things, uh, uh, features of, of eucalypt flowers are that they're white and they're always out on the tips, you know, they're not deep they're hidden inside the vegetation. They're out where flying foxes, remember, they're not echolocating, they're using their eyes. Mm -hmm. They can hear their squabbles from their mates and any of you who have been near where flying foxes are feeding at night and all the squawks that's coming out and they've got a pretty good sense of smell too. So the <coughs> uh, flowers of eucalypts are quite uh, well um, designed for no nocturnal pollinator. This is a big uh, black butt here and for a while, uh, until recently, to all climate changing things, there was a distinct relationship between grey-headed flying foxes and this tree. In fact, the, the distribution of the tree down the east coast of Australia was exactly the same as the, the grey-headed flying fox. Okay. Uh, next one. Now, these are all the timbers that flying foxes pollinate and the health of the forests that are growing these trees, spotted gum, ironbarks, couple of species of ironbark, creamer and that, brush box, black butt, blue gum. These trees, if anyone's got a nice polished floor or timber frame, flying foxes somewhere have been in the team that's given you that timber. So the East Coast forests are really dependent on flying foxes spreading the pollen. Remember, because the flowers can only be pollinated at night. And the flowers also what Katrina found is the maximum amount of nectar is produced around midnight and 2 a.m. So it's looking for a nocturnal pollinator. And in the morning when the lorikeets and bees turn up, that's the leftover from the night. So they're sort of cashing in on what Question name, very quickly. If you were minding lorikeets, caring for lorikeets, would it be worth your while going out at midnight? Yeah. Oh, you okay. get more, you get more nectar in the flowers. Oh, thank you. Mm. Okay, so you know, we'll look at paperbarks. But paperbarks are another tree that um, 
they're not dependent on um, Firefox's pollination, but they do provide a lot of um, uh, nectar, and they're important. Generally, uh, I think they've all finished here now, but they, uh, in autumn, coming early winter, that's the main uh, food source for flying foxes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the next slide, what happened down on the Gold Coast, this is um, the casino here, and this used to be a lot of paperback swamp, and there were some enormous flying fox colonies at Corumban and up in the valley there. But as all the paperback uh, swamp got filled in, there's Cascade Gardens, and there was a colony there for a while of flying foxes, but they've, uh, the, the food resources there have just about have been eliminated by canal systems. And you know where the next lot of good paperback swamps are found? Sunshine Coast. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the flying fox problem on the Gold Coast has been transferred up the coast to Sunshine Coast. And that's why we've got problems with colonies, you know, from down at, uh, well, you know, there's a heap of colonies here on the Sunshine Coast. Thanks to the Gold Coast. Next one. Um, now, they're pretty good at seed dispersers. You can see the cheek pouch on this bake here. He's got a full seed. What often happens in their social behaviour, um, they'll turn up and they'll start eating and then a big dominant animal will come in and chase them away. So they fly off with a couple of bits of fruit and seed in their mouth and process it, suck all the soft part off and then spit the seed out. So that's distributing uh, the seeds away from the tree where birds of the daytime will sit here and peck and chew on that and then it'll fall it's down like underneath mm. and it's not uh, dispersing it at all. So they're quite uh, important in taking seeds away from their social behaviour. Now, the different sorts that we've got, um, the little reds, which are a reddish colour like that, and they all pack in. And we're really not so sure because they pack in whether it's summer or winter, um, like that. It's a social thing and it may be a protection thing or it may have something to do with um, uh, maintaining their body temperature so the ones in the centre don't have to worry so much. Next one, so they're little reds and they're easy to pick because their wings are semi-transparent like that when they're flying over. Remember I said flying foxes don't have a tail? You see the gap in there? But you can see the, the wing pattern there, thumb and then the four fingers mm -hmm. out like that. Um, so pretty much like me, just go like that. Mm -hmm. Except I've got long fingers. Mm -hmm. But little reds, easy to pick. They're a reddish brown colour and their wings are semi-transparent. And they come around in big mobs. Next one, black. And that's their name, so we've got a couple of nice black ones there. They do have patches of uh, brown fur around on their neck at times, and you'll see little patches there. But it's often difficult if you wander into a flying fox colony and there are grey heads and blacks there. If you're looking up into the bright light, sometimes it's a bit hard to work out who these characters are. But they're the majority of blacks, and they like to be up real high in a flying fox colony, and they're the black flying foxes, and they've been increasing their numbers regularly now for the last 20 or so years. Next picture, grey heads. This is one of the prettiest. A lot of overseas people come and say, oh, what a beautiful looking bat. Mm -hmm. They're very pretty bats with their grey head, and their nice rufous collar goes all the way around. They've got fur all the way down their legs to their toes, uh, which uh, the other bats have uh, bare legs. They're like cyclists. They like to take their hands. <laughs> Up north, uh, you get spectacles. They come down to about Mackay. There's some records there now. Very pretty. They're the ones uh, in Cairns in the main street. Um, they're the ones that suffer badly from ticks. Um, if any of you are up in that area, make sure you go and see the uh, the bat exhibition at uh, Atherton. It's uh, amazing. Um, the, the person running that uh, show has got big cages and a lot of information about bats. So that's the spectacle. So they're the four ones we've got. 
little reds, black spectacle or grey head. The blacks go, uh, I should say little reds, they're the most widespread and they go inland and they often follow uh, flowering river red gums and they've actually spread right across here to Adelaide now as well and they're moving further down towards uh, Perth. Black flying foxes start here, go all the way around. In 1975 when I arrived in Brisbane, they were just getting to Brisbane. Now they've come down here and we'll go to the next slide and see what's happened. The blacks, here they were, they were sticking to the coast pretty well here. They got to Sydney in about 2010 and now they've got to uh, Melbourne and right around to Adelaide. And guess where they are when they got to Adelaide? They went straight to the Botanic Gardens. <laughs> and a lot of you would have remembered what We're happened the with the, the greyheads in Melbourne. Well, the greyheads have also got right around to Adelaide, but that recently they crossed that straight and they're in Tasmania for the first time. Oh, so wow. all these fine foxes are heading south. And people don't like, because of the political uh, problems with it, but to me it's pretty obvious that there's um, uh, climate change, things are getting hotter, like we're about to have the hottest uh, July we've ever had, and they're moving south. But the big worry is, for me, is that in the Goulburn Valley and places like that, where they're growing stone fruit and, and that, they're not used to flying foxes in their orchards or anything, and there's a lot of complaints about flying fox colonies coming out of Victoria, and Adelaide went into panic mode in the the botanic gardens, and I don't blame them because flying foxes can do a lot of damage. Uh, and they sort of contact people up in New South Wales and Queensland and say, oh, you, you've got flying foxes, you must know how to move them on. Tell us what we've got to do. Yeah. Sorry, we don't. We haven't coordinated the research about camp removals at all, and it's still a big bit of a mess. But they're on their way south. The other worrying thing for me is, are there the right sort of trees there for them to feed in, or are they going to become urban nuisances? Next one. Ah, oh, this is a this is a satellite tracker, and to me, I as a scientist, I've got to weigh up the balance of the information that you get from putting something like that on a flying fox, how it might interfere there with their behaviour versus how useful is this information. Anyway, this happened here at, um, at Coolum. They banded some black, there's a black flying fox with a, I was telling you about, that gets a bit of uh, brown on it, but you see his heads all black. But this is an aerial and these are little solar panels. And uh, this is, this gives um, continuous recordings as a satellite goes over. It's picking up information from this uh, next slide. Uh, they put some on uh, flying foxes down at Bateman's Bay. Um, I think I think there was about five. Do you remember the center one? Remember this? Uh, they tagged down there. No, I don't. Sorry. Anyway, this is where they all moved to. This oh. shows you how how they left Bateman's Bay. None of them went down to Victoria. I think it was. Uh, uh, getting towards the uh, winter time mm -hmm. and they all moved up and you can see where they had camps and this is uh, mm -hmm. probably Ipswich and right up here there's Fraser Island so they've gone right up past there. Where's, were they all blacks? Um, no, I think these are greyheads. Uh -huh. uh, um, oh gee, I should have checked on that. But that just shows you the movements uh, from oh. some bats up a uh, causing a bit of distress in Bateman's Bay that I landed in town. But I think the next slide shows a little bit, uh, you know, this one's a little bit easier to follow. These are grey-headed flying foxes that were um, banded at um, McLean, that's right. Um, so they've been, when they, they put, and these were tracked with uh, little radio trackers rather than satellites. Uh, and this is in five months, mind you. So from the claim, they went down to the coast there, up to the amber, back and across the amber. Then all of a sudden, whoop, well, up to the rain. And 
that was done in a really short time uh, from memory, only a couple of days. So it probably would have stopped somewhere, but it just depends on where people are, um, got their receivers for it. From the rain, it went up, came up to Brisbane, out to Ipswich, down to Lillian Rocks near Nimbin, Jigai, Lismore, down to uh, Broadwater, uh, just near Ballina, back to Lismore, and uh, way up to Cleveland. That's in five months. And that, to me, that's an animal that's searching for food. Mm -hmm. uh, it's looking for good food supplies. It's gone up there, no good, gone back here, no good. So it's, it's on the move. But it tells you the problems of different states. Uh, like New South Wales regards greyheads as um, endangered and they've got uh, regulations about um, handling it, where Queensland a bit reluctant to do it, even though the Commonwealth said you should be um, treating it as an endangered species. Next one. Now, what's happening with flying foxes, mainly for their own protection. Like a lot of flying fox camps uh, have been shot up. I've been to camps that have disappeared and you go in there and the shotgun cartridges everywhere. And I don't mind and I can understand fruit growers getting upset about it, but when I find out that a gun club has been there and the local policeman was in amongst them, uh, shooting at them as a target and just something to shoot, I think, why don't you go and shoot at you know, a clay thing hanging in a tree? These poor flying foxes, a lot of flying foxes, when you see them fly over, you can see pellet holes in their wings. And I think it's not very much uh, it's not sporting shooters at all. So they come and they end up at, um, in urban areas. And let's have a look at the next slide. And so the problems that arise, whereabouts, like sometimes they'll be near a school or a, a, a hospital or something, or in people's backyards. The noise they can make, they certainly make a lot of noise. Uh, smell, they've got distinctive smell. But if you uh, ever smell the billy goat, the flying fox is nowhere near smell of goats or say a, a pig farm. Um, people worry about their real estate. If they're trying to sell and open the back door and there's a flying fox colony, it's, you're going to wipe out a lot of uh, potential buyers. Um, health reason, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, backyard fruit raiders, yeah, they'll take um, unprotected fruit. And people just uh, that are a bit anti wildlife and don't like bats and don't like uh, urban uh, flying fox colonies. Oh, sorry, I No, no, that's all right. Now, <coughs> one thing about flying foxes is that their mums are, are very slow breeders, and to turn over um, flying fox populations, um, they only have one young a year, and most females that are in the wild, it's only after about three years old. You can see this one carrying a little baby hanging there. You see it probably a shotgun pellet hole there. Sometimes they do a bit of damage landing in a prickly tree or something, but more than often it's a, a pellet uh, that's been fired at them. So there's a mum flying fox carrying a baby and they carry them till they're uh, quite heavy. Uh, what's your about average? Full, about full, until they're fully furred and thermoregulating, four to five weeks. Yeah, might, might that be up 120 grams or something? Uh, yes, at least 120 grams. So that's a they're lot. about 85 grams when they're born and they can't thermoregulate their, and their little tummies are absolutely bare and so they spend the time close up against mum and they keep warm from mum body heat. And so until they get fully furred, that's the only way they can regulate temperature. Then she leaves them in the colony at night after a little bit of hugging and haring, um, but once okay. they're fully furred. So yeah, 100, 100 odd, no, yeah. 200 grams. Yeah. Yeah, so the little babies, fully furred around the back, but on their tummy, totally naked. And you think, oh, when I first saw that, I thought, oh, gee, it's got dermatitis or something. <laughs> but no, that's how it keeps itself warm. And you can always tell a female that's had a, a young, at the night time, the mother wants to go out to feed, she'll hang the young one there, but it'll hang onto a nipple 
and mum will take off and this young one's hanging on to his back <laughs> and in his teeth, he's got a little recurved teeth, he's hanging on to mum's nipple as hard as he can <laughs> so it gets stretched. So very easy to see a female that's had young. So they're pretty busy girls. When you look at their calendar, they're mating from March to April, then they're pregnant from April right through to October, start to have their young, then November and December, they're lactating in January and February, but guess what? March, they're back mating again. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the problems in managing colonies. You know, when do you disturb these animals or try to chase them away? At what stage of these females, you can't disturb them while they're having young or while they're lactating, looking after young. Uh, there's only a little gap here after they've mated and early stages of pregnancy where it's suitable for um, you to be chasing them off. Now that happens with grey heads and blacks, but the little reds are totally different. They've got uh, six months out of uh, sequence and they're giving birth in um, May, the end of April and May. So it makes management of flying fox colonies really complex. Next. Right, just remember, flying foxes don't echo a cape. There's no, see the mouths are closed when they're flying. And most of the pictures, you probably remember the ones I showed you of little micro bats flying, um, have all got their mouth open echo locating. So they use sense of vision, they've got extraordinarily good eyes, uh, smell and calls to navigate at night. Okay. Oh, now this is the, what happened here at, um, at Coolum. Uh, there are three different bats here, the red one, these are satellite tracking ones. Okay, so there's a red one, a blue one, and a yellow one, and they're all black flying foxes. And this is where they got up to, you can see the one here, the yellow one, went right down to the bottom of Bribey Island, up, round, this is all food searching. This one, the red one, um, I got a suspicion that the, the bat carrying that might have been having a few problems that didn't go very far, and it disappeared fairly quickly uh, after those short things, and I, I'm a bit suspicious that um, she, that bat might have been coping too well with the satellite. The blue one you can see when searching around. And flying foxes stay where there's food. If there's food, they're not going to go far away from it. When they start doing long movements, uh, and this is really important in terms of trying to move a flying fox colony, if they've got a food source nearby that they're going out every night, they don't want to go anywhere. So you can chase them away, but they'll just go somewhere nearby and set up a camp there. And when the fuss stops, they'll go back. And that's exactly what happened down here in, in Cassia Drive. Mm -hmm. That the council spent 250000 chasing the flying foxes and they only went three or 400 metres up the nature reserve. Then all the people up there said, oh, you chased them away for that part. We want them chased away again. So they did it again and they went back to where they were before. Half a million dollars and they got them nowhere. So that's, this is a problem because there's food. There's food here. If they wait till there's no food, like when all the now, where farm foxes are gone by themselves, yeah. um, when there's no paper larks flowering or no pink blood ones, then the flying foxes will move. And if you want to move them, that's the time then you've got to do it. Next one. So I can understand the problems that uh, uh, residents have with all their worries. Um, the smell and the noise and then this fear of disease. And there is um, the disease that people are going to worry about is lysivirus, which is similar to rabies. And of all those people who work with flying foxes, we get rabies vaccination and that protects us from lysivirus. But it is very similar to um, um, rabies, uh, sorry, lysivirus is very similar to rabies and no one should ever <coughs> be dying uh, from uh, being bitten by a flying fox and getting uh, lysivirus. The last little boy who um, 
Guy bitten and died. He was too scared to tell anyone he, he was bitten. And it's a real shame because, you know, his local hospital could have uh, given him a vaccination against it. Um, and it's part of education. It's part of why I like to talk to people like you about, you know, if you get bitten by a flying fox, um, first of all, you should never try to pick up a sick or injured one. You wouldn't do it with a snake or anything like that. You can cover it. Don't let your dog or anything else get near it. Cover it with that and ring these girls here from, oh, sorry, <laughs> from, us, um, from that rescue and they'll come and deal with it. Um, so, uh, and I'll get on to the um, Hendra in a minute. So, um, we can't do much about the smell. Um, it's not, um, as far as we know, well, you certainly won't get this virus from bat poo or the smell. Um, there's a question mark about Hendra virus, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So it, it really is up to us to manage flying foxes, to stop shooting at colonies that are outside of an uh, urban area and let them camp somewhere that's, you know, like at the Stella Mara school backyard there and here. We need to have areas set aside. They're important parts of our wildlife. Um, and we should, we, we really need to look after them. Oh, this is Sorry. about noise. <coughs> um, why they're so noisy is that they hear almost identical to us. Grey haired, little red, you can see the human goes right through the same areas from here around 10 kilohertz and up to 15 and that. Uh, to move fly foxes, remember they don't have echolocation, they hear just like us and that's why their squawks are so loud. Um, and that's been the principal method of trying to move a flying fox colony is banging drums and sirens and uh, bird fright and all this sort of stuff. Um, it's very um, distressing for uh, people, uh, for pets, like the big one I was involved with at, at Ipswich, um, budgies and canaries died and cats ran away, and dogs ran away from mm -hmm. home. Um, you know, it's... it's um, uh, because the hearing is on at the same frequency as ours, uh, we've got to try and be a little bit smarter about how we might move flying foxes if we have to. They have an almost human-like scream, don't they? Yeah, you know, um, Roger Cole's a person who's worked on vocalisation. There's 40 different calls that flying foxes use, you know, like mother to babies, babies, mother to sister, mother to female, other female, mother to male, um, and very complex. After whales, they're the next mammal with the most um, types of vocalisation. And what sounds to us like, you know, squawk and funny noises, if it's analysed properly, um, there's a whole heap of different communication. I always thought if bees could tell each other where the direction where uh, nectar is with a little dance at a hive, surely a smart animal like a flying fox can tell uh, its mates in the colony where the next, uh, where a good place to feed at night is. And we, we've got no idea whether they do that or not, but I know that by being in a colony and watching what happens late in the afternoon, if there's not a lot of food around, big old uh, males and females will disappear real early and take off mm. and won't be circling around or anything like that and go to a silky oak or something that's flowering um, where others will get up and they'll mill around and they'll wait till someone heads off and then they'll all follow. So there's a lot of interesting uh, information passed on that way. Now Hendra, you notice how things have gone very quiet about Hendra lately? <laughs> Uh, this is total schmozzles research. The first thing that should have been done as a survey to see where Hendra antibodies are, all, all up and down the coast. But biosecurity in their <coughs> wisdom said if a horse has got antibodies positive for Hendra, we'll put it down because it could mean that it's got the virus as well. It's, it's an old philosophy and it's been poorly used. So no one was going to let them test their horses 
because if the horse had antibodies, I mean, the horse could be perfectly healthy and it survived a mild dose of Hendra or whatever. Um, so they've got no idea of how far or wide Hendra is spread in the environment. And the other thing is, just because a horse has got Hendra and, and it dies, and not necessarily, if they're not checking for other viruses and things, it's not necessary that that horse died from Hendra. It could, and there's a couple of bad viruses for horses in the Northern Territory and up in the Kimberley um, that are killing horses. Um, and, you know, it could be them, it could be another virus. Um, it, it's, um, the whole thing has been a real muddle. And if I was a horse owner, I'd be really cross with biosecurity. And it's the same thing that happened with prawns. Um, CSIRO Fisheries told Biosecurity Queensland don't <coughs> let raw prawns get um, imported into Australia because it doesn't kill white spot. You'll end up with white spot in Australia. Uh, ten years later, what happens? We get white spot here. Um, CSIRO, who were part of the Hendra research, and actually they sent the Hendra virus to um, America, where they made the um, vaccine for it. And guess what else they made a vaccine for Hendra for as well? For pussycats. Mm -hmm. Because pussycats, you can transfer uh, Hendra from a flying fox to a pussycat, and, can, and can, the virus can go into a dog. Um, I'll show you in a minute. But um, the Americans uh, are fairly obvious that they thought cats were a big part of the, uh, the virus and, and it's, um, the way it spreads. And there were a couple of instances where Henry turned up and they hadn't seen flying foxes for ages. Oh, look at the time. Okay, yes. let's have a quick look at the, the rest of these. Okay, this, this is just another bit of information where Hendra has occurred from near Coffs Harbour up here. It's the same distribution as the stable fly, uh, an imported uh, March fly type thing from South Africa that also carries viruses and that, and they haven't bothered to look at it despite um, CSIRO saying you've got to look at this fly, it could be a transmitter. Um, next. But flying foxes have enough trouble of their own without us interfering with them. This, it's 42 degrees in a heat wave and flying foxes, these are nearly all black by the look, because they're the ones up high in a little black box and they just drop out of the tree dead. 42 degrees and that's not an unusual temperature in a heat wave. Next. Uh, they've got natural predators like this uh, white bellied sea eagle. Next one. Nearly all uh, colonies have got a resident couple of pythons. And mm -hmm. you can see his eye there and his dislocated jaw and he's smiling at a, a flying fox. And power lines um, often where bat rescue get, the mother can get electrocuted and the baby's still alive. It's insulated in between. Next. Um, backyard netting. Uh, people with good intentions. Um, this is um, a quite uh, quite serious how bats get caught up. And you'll see other information here about them getting caught on barbed wire fences. Um, in New Caledonia and other places, um, food and medicine, uh, this is something that needs to be looked at seriously. Every old culture where flying foxes are found from Southeast Asia in um, Northern Australia with the Aborigines in Papua. If you've got children with uh, chest problems, bronchitis and chest problems, feed them flying fox and that will cure them. Oh. And it's never been seriously looked at, but it's so widespread through so many different cultures that needs to be looked at. Okay, and thank oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> we've got, we've got a